So I'm going to talk about the mirror neuron system. It's a bit of a different topic than what we heard uh, from the previous speaker. Uh, now, the mirror neuron system is a newly uh, discovered network of neurons within the brain uh, of primates and humans, dedicating to understanding the intentions and goals of others. So I'm going to walk through sort of the discovery of the mirror neuron system in order to try to communicate how it comes that we're able to understand other people. Now, I'm actually going to start discussing the single neurons within the primate brain. And the reason why I'm going to do that is to use that as a platform for describing and discussing action understanding in humans and babies. Okay. So if you take a look at this picture above me here, there are, of course, many ways in which this can be described. Um, I'm thinking of two primary ways. You could say that one of these girls are moving her hand towards the left, approaching the cup, the blue cup, yeah. But that is not how this scene is particularly described or perceived by people. Generally, most people would say that she's reaching for the cup, while the other girl is attending to those actions. And this is sort of the type of thing I'm talking about, how we're able to make sense of this and attribute intentions and goal directedness in other people. Now, in order to understand this, we have to go back to the early 90s and a group of prominent researchers in Parma in Italy. Now, they, they were very much interested in investigating the motor cortex of, of uh, macaque monkeys. Now, the motor cortex is the part of the brain that is involved in processing action uh, or movement. So, for example, if I was confronted with an apple while being hungry, the rest of the brain and my consciousness will say to the motor cortex, according to this standard uh, pre-mirror neuron theory of motor uh, development or motor processes, would order the motor cortex to uh, make the hand reach for the apple and put it into the mouth, right? So the motor cortex would, uh, would perform these, make sure that we perform these actions. Now, this in itself is not an easy task, and it is a task that is uh, well-deserving of, of many experimental studies. And this group in Parma, they were investigating single cells within this motor cortex by inserting uh, small and highly sensitive sensors into the brain, investigating activation of single neurons. Now, the information was being fed to a computer, of course, they could do fancy analysis of what was going on later on. But for this story, it's important to realize that it was also fed to a speaker. So whenever the uh, uh, monkey was performing a reach, for example, the neuron would fire, and you would hear that sort of a <laughs> from the speaker. Now, the legend goes that at one particularly hot summer day, one of the Italian researchers was going into the lab where the monkey was living uh, with an ice cream. Now, I'm saying this is a legend because this is how I've heard the story, and it doesn't actually mean that there was an ice cream, or it doesn't mean that it was a hot summer day, but regardless, an Italian researcher was walking into a lab with a monkey who had these sensors put into the brain. Okay. Now, what was so surprising in this context is that uh, whenever the researcher was eating his or her ice cream, you heard the sound from a speaker in the background. I assume the researcher turned around and looked at the monkey who was sitting like this. Maybe like this. I don't know. But the point is, anyway, that the monkey was not performing any action. And despite of that, these neurons within the motor cortex of its brain was being active and firing. And this was the start of a sort of a revolution in how we perceive the brain. These, these, this part of the brain that was assumed to be involved primarily in executing actions turned out to also be involved in understanding or firing when perceiving someone else perform a typical kind of action. Now, there's been tons of studies on this topic. And as I said, these, it turns out that the, all of these neurons in the motor cortex and in associate areas fire when a monkey reaches for something, other neurons fire when the monkey puts something in his mouth, and also when they perform different kinds of communicative acts, like lip smacking. Now, some of these neurons, about 10 to 20 percent, also fire when they see someone else do the same type of action. Some neurons fire only at a particular type of action that relates to sort of only during reaching um, with precision grip like this, or other neurons fire to a larger range of different types of actions. 
Now, why am I going on about these single neurons within the monkey's brain? Uh, it's because I want to move over to humans. So having known, having discovered that there are the, this system that is active both during action execution and action observation, uh, people turn their focus to adult humans. Now, when you're studying an adult human, you can't put a sensor into the brain of normal, normal healthy, healthy adults. So you have to use different techniques in order to investigate if there is such a thing as a mirror neuron system and if you want to investigate what it's all for. So one uh, way of doing this is to turning to fMRI. I skipped a slide there, but we'll just have to live with that. Uh, now, here on the side you can see a human brain. Now, and three different areas being highlighted with color. And this demonstrates what, uh, which areas of the brain become particularly active in a human when that human is observing hand actions, mouth actions, and foot actions. Now, these same areas are the ones that become active when uh, the person performs these actions themselves. So it seems like there is this sort of similar type of system within a human that maps other people's actions onto their own motor system. Now I'm going back to the slide I forgot to mention. One thing that is very fascinating about these neurons, regardless of whether they are in, in monkeys or in humans, is that they, they don't only encode the visual features, sort of the, 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 the sight of a reaching hand or a foot kicking or something like that, but they actually encode the goal of that action. And that is, that is the important thing, I guess, to, to mention. Uh, and they're, to some degree, abstract. For example, in, um, in the macaque, you have uh, the, the neurons firing when the monkey puts something in the mouth, when they see someone else performing the same action. But the same neuron might also fire with, with the sound of a peanut being cracked. Because that is something that is, can be associated to the goal of eating. So there's something about this system that helps us understand goals and intentions. When it comes to humans, so I'm just jumping back and forth there a bit. The same system is, turns out to be highly experience dependent. Now this is the key to understanding why we have this system at all. Now experience dependency in this context means that when I'm good at performing a certain action, I have a strong representation of that action within my own brain. And that means that I'm able to use that strong, strong activation in the brain to make sense of other people's actions. So knowing something well makes me better able to understand others performing that same action. This is an example of this. I don't know how well it can be seen. These are two sort of um, turning moves on the top being performed by a classical ballet dancer. And on the bottom, it's the same type of, type of movement, but in this turn, it's a, it's a martial arts kick being performed by an expert at capoeira. Now, they look fairly similar, these two actions, but they're actually quite different in terms of the motor components that are being involved in, in performing them. Now, when you present these two to experts in capoeira and ballet, it turns out that the ballet dancer have a much stronger activation to seeing the ballet move, but not to the capoeira move, and the reverse. Obviously, compared to me, that don't have a clue about any of these things, I have some activation, but not at all as high as those that uh, are experts in this. Suggesting to some extent that there is a stronger understanding of other people's actions when you know how to do the action yourself. Now, this has been demonstrated even more directly in other types of studies where uh, adults watch someone picking up pieces of uh, peas with chopsticks, moving them from one place to another. When you observe someone do that, you get a lot, a lot of activation in your brain in the area that would be involved in your own manual actions. Now, the amount of activation that you get correlates and is related very strongly to the degree of your own experience doing that. So someone who has been eating sushi two times a week, for example, has a lot stronger activation when watching someone else perform chopsticks moves than someone who's only done it once a week for the last year. 
Again, demonstrating a high experience dependency in the ability to relate to others. Now, these systems are also extremely flexible, and a, a very nice study came out a few years ago investigating mirror neurons in adults that don't have arms. So if you're born without arms, how do you make sense of other people's actions, manual actions? At a very flat rate, you could say that, well, they shouldn't understand anything because they don't have any arms, so they shouldn't have anything to understand with, you know? But it turns out that if someone without arms watch a manual reach like this, they code it with their legs. So the part of their brain that are involved in, in moving the legs and the feet become active when they see someone reach. Assuming again that you, you take the function of the action and you represent that within your own motor system. Who cares? There are all these neurons firing you know, when you see someone do something and it's, it's, uh, it's coded by goals and if you don't have arms you do it with the legs. But why? You know, what's the function of this system? Well, there are a few ideas out there. Some are crazy, some are not so crazy. I'm going to try to argue for in one particular interpretation of why we have a mirror neuron system, or not rather why, that's, that's probably wrong, but what it's for. Why do, what do we use the mirror neuron system for? And in order to explain that, I need to go through one more study. And it's a study about basketball. And I get a bit uh, reluctant how to do this because I, I have no idea of anything about basketball. My brain would not be very active uh, in this task. But um, imagine that you're watching a movie of a basketball player dribbling a ball, throwing it into the basket. basket thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to look that up. So I was thinking, well, waking up this morning, I have to check that word. What is it? Is it, is it a cage or a basket? What is it? But now I know it's a basket. Thanks. Uh, right, so he throws the ball into the bucket. At some point in time, this movie freezes, and the subjects watching this are asked, so what's going to happen? Will he be able to put the ball in the basket or not? Now, if you would ask this question to a sports journalist who's dedicated his whole life to watching basketball, they actually did this he has to not only see the manual action or the, the, the full body action, but he has to see the ball moving towards the basket in order to be able to extrapolate what's going to happen and predict whether the ball will go into the basket or not. Now, the same is true for couch potatoes like my, myself, or I wasn't in this study, but other couch potatoes. Uh, watching this would have to see the ball move towards the basket to sort of accurately adjust, uh, assume whether the ball would make it or not. Now, when you have uh, expert basketball players watching this, they don't need all this information. They just need to see this. And if you freeze the... Well, assuming that there is a ball here, right? There is a ball here right now. They only need to see the manual action, or the manual, I'm saying, the, the, the action of the body, in order to accurately estimate whether the ball will hit the basket or not. So they're able to use information that is within the action that they see to anticipate a future event. Now that is based on experience, and that is what I'm assuming is based on the mirror neuron process. So what I will try to argue is that the mirror neuron system is involved in anticipating other people's actions. Now in order to go further and, and sort of describe what I mean here, I'm going to talk about babies. Now, there are two reasons why I do this. I'm a baby researcher, so it makes it only natural that I will try to sneak babies in here at some point or another. Now, there is also another reason. It's, it's that it's a good example of what I'm trying to say. So it turns out that babies have mirror neurons. How do we know this? Well, Again, you can't use the same techniques, this techniques described before. You can't put a baby in an fMRI, fMRI machine, for example. And you can definitely not record the activation of single cells within an, uh, an infant. So what you do is that, in this case, we have put on a net of electrodes that measuring the electric activity from the brain. It's called EEG. And when you do this, on, in this case, a six-month-old, uh, you can see the same type of activation occurring when the baby would perform, for example, a reach, and when the baby sees a reach. 
we don't have to go into the technical details about what that is, but it's um, called mu desynchronization. It's irrelevant for this context. But it's important to know that uh, they actually have a similar type of mirroring uh, within their brain. And it's also experience dependent. So infants who are good at crawling, now a bit older infants, uh, have a stronger activation within their uh, motor system when, they're see, when they see someone crawling than babies who have little experience or no experience crawling. So there seems to be this similarity between the adult mirror neuron system and the single mirror neurons of the monkeys. But babies don't only have a passive uh, activation of, of, a, of a mirror neuron system, which is a bit vague. It turns out that babies, like adults, actually anticipate what is going to happen next. Now, to back up a bit, anticipation is a central component of everything we do. For example, if I move my feet forward like this, without anticipating this, my body feels that when I do this, knows that when I do this, the center of gravity will change. And if I don't anticipate that, by moving my body backwards before leaning forward with my foot, I would just fall flat on the stage. Okay? The same is actually true for this. Just basically fall on my side. So for any type of very simple action, the body is always anticipating what is going to happen next. The, the same is true actually when, when you perform simple actions, like um, uh, getting a cup of coffee in the morning. Think about this in th this evening when you're having dinner, for example, and sort of just passively try to think about what you're watching. Now, what you definitely will do is look at the glass before your hand has arrived. And that is an anticipation of your own actions, right? We always do this. And it's actually the same when we watch someone else. So if you're having dinner tonight with someone else, just lean back and see what they're watching. And you will, I can guarantee you that what will happen is that their eyes, or your eyes, would go to their wine glass or coffee glass or whatever before the hand, their hand arrives there. So we always anticipate the goal of others' actions. And there are many reasons for this. One is, of course, to be, stay ahead and be able to have a normal and smooth interaction with others. It also helps us to overcome the internal motor, the lag of the, inter of the motor system, because it takes time for the brain to, to calculate stuff. So you need to be one step ahead, otherwise you would always have to sort of correct yourself when you're uh, doing different things. And the same thing occurs in babies. So in this particular case, you see one of these girls eating pieces of banana with a spoon. Now, if you present this to a six-month-old baby who have experienced putting stuff in their mouth, they're actually, th these infants are actually looking at the mouth of this person before the food arrives. Now, we know this because we're able to measure where infants are looking with eye-tracking technology, uh, which is just basically a fancy name for a camera f recording uh, the infant's eyes, uh, so we can calculate where they're looking. But the babies do this, but they don't do this if this is an action that they cannot... I'm pointing there, I should point over here, because I have a screen there. <laughs> but anyway, if we instead present uh, the same age infants, or for that matter, the same infants, with a spoon moving on its own to the mouth, not displaying any manual actions, uh, infants don't anticipate that. And if we demonstrate to infants uh, uh, a person taking a, a comb and combing their hair, which is something that six-month-olds do not do for very many reasons, one of them being lack of hair. Um, they d they're not able to anticipate that either, either. So it does demonstrate that there is the same type of experience dependency in infants, in infants' ability to anticipate the goal of other people's actions. Now, if we do this instead, she suddenly takes the spoon and puts it towards the other person. Six-month-olds can't anticipate, or 12-month-olds. Inf sorry, infants have to be 12-month-old in order to anticipate this. And we assume that this has to do with the fact that infants have less experience being fed than putting stuff in their own mouth. So we've actually measured this, and it turns out that in this particular study, 193 days of experience being fed is required for babies to anticipate this action. But once they've reached this threshold, they look at the mouth of this other person before the spoon arrives. Now, what I'm trying to argue here is that what we're actually tapping here, though indirectly, is the very same underlying principles that we saw in adults 
and in the, the macaque monkeys, which is the mirror neuron system taking the motor representations that you have and using those to make sense of other people's actions. And this would be true for six-month-olds, it would be true for 12-month-olds, for adult humans and macaque monkeys. In order, so the mirror neuron system, I'm suggesting, help us understand and anticipate the goal of other people's actions, allowing us to understand others as ourselves. Thanks. <laughs>